Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for being here today. Appreciate you coming to worship. It's very important that we do this as Christians, that we gather together and uh, magnify the Savior and make much of the Scripture and be transformed. And so I want you to grab your Bible, open it up to Romans chapter 12 this morning, the first two verses, Romans chapter 12. Now, as you're doing that, let me ask you a question. All right. What does a pirate look like? Okay, comes to your mind. What does a pirate look like? Well, it's going to be uh, maybe they got a bandana on their head, gold earring, hook maybe, peg leg maybe, patch maybe. You know, it's tough being a pirate. So you got all those things going on, and that's your picture of a pirate. Well, here's another. What uh, when when I say the word cowboy, what comes to your mind? You get a picture there. Cowboy sitting on a horse, got a Stetson on, six-shooter, lasso, chaps, boots, all that sort of thing. You get a picture. Okay, those are easy. Here's a tougher one. When I say the word Christian, what comes to your mind? It's a little harder to get a picture of that, right? I mean, you might say, well, you know, it uh, looks like Jesus, yeah. What does that look like? I mean, we're not talking about a long robe and a beard. Talking about something maybe a little harder to get a handle on. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Is that those of us that want to look like Jesus, we want to live like Jesus, how can we do it? We've been talking so far in the book of Romans, the first eight and then the next three and then first eleven chapters about doctrine basically. About what we believe, but then we need to see, well how do we behave? If this is what God says, what are we supposed to do about it? And as we move into chapter 12, that's where we are. We're to some, some fundamental, everyday things to do and not to do in the Christian life. This is how we live our Christian life. This is how we look more like Christ. And so I want you to see that. And as we do, we're going to be looking at three concepts this morning. Two positive, one negative. The first is presentation. The second is confirmation, do not be conformed. And then the third is transformation. And God uses that in our lives to make us more like Christ. Let's read the text. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. He starts off this passage by saying, therefore. And when he's saying that, he's saying, look back to what I've already said. And so what has he said in those first 11 chapters? He said, well, there's nobody righteous, okay? Without Jesus, nobody righteous. But Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the dead. And now when we embrace that, when we have faith, when we believe that, God declares us to be righteous. He declares us to be part of of his family. And then he shows us how to live that Christian life. And so chapters 6 through 8, he's talking about the living of it. We're to, we're to think in certain ways, but especially in chapter 8, he said, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to live in you. God just doesn't say, here, live the Christian life. He says, no, I'm going to come to live in you. I'm going to help you do it. So the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. And then in chapters 9, 10, 11, he talks about um, Israel specifically. In a couple of weeks, Travis is going to talk out of uh, Romans chapter 10, that great evangelistic passage that we have there. But then we move into chapter 12, and he says, Therefore, because of all of this, I urge you to do some things. Because of what God has done, here's the way you need to respond to that. So I urge you, brothers... By the mercies of God, because of all those things he has done for you. I mean, all those blessings you have. He's brought you into his family. He's given you peace. He's done all those amazing things for you. And because of that, here's what we do. 
And this is the part of what we're going to talk about this morning. He says, first of all, presentation. Present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. So as we try to learn how to live this Christian life and to look more like Christians, here's part of the beginning of it, is that we learn to make this presentation. We present ourselves, we present our bodies to him. It's like we're saying, Lord, I see what you've done for me, and and you're an amazing God, and you've done all kinds of incredible things, and now, because of what you have done, because you have saved me and adopted me and washed my sin away, brought me into the family, because of all that, I make this presentation to you, and it's me. I give you me. And amazingly enough, God wants us. So he says, make a presentation, present your bodies, not just part of you, okay, the whole package, present yourselves, and then he says, as a living and holy sacrifice. Now that living sacrifice is a novel idea, because if you read the Old Testament, what do you find? A lot of dead, bloody sacrifices. God set it up that way. There was this, in the Old Testament, there was this pattern, and you would bring a lamb, for example, you would bring a lamb to the tabernacle and later to the temple, and you would bring it as an offering to God. It was valuable, and you brought it as something to be given to God. So they would take that animal, they would slit its throat, its blood would be poured out, then it would be placed on the altar and burned up, and the smoke would rise up to God As a gift to him. Now that went on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And then about 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to be the last blood dead offering. Jesus came and he presented himself. John said of him, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So it's not going to be a lamb that we bring anymore for our horrible sins, but rather Jesus comes and he gives his body. He's the spotless lamb of God. His throat is not cut, but rather he is nailed to the cross. His blood is poured out. He dies. He is placed in the tomb. On the third day, he's raised from the dead. Then 40 days later, like that smoke ascent from the offering, Jesus goes up to the Father, and the Father accepts that sacrifice. And Hebrews says that doesn't happen over and over and over again like thousands and thousands and thousands of lambs had to be slain. But when the perfect sacrifice, Jesus, came once for all, once did it forever, you don't have to do that anymore. It's done. But now, the scripture says, it's not a a sacrifice to be killed and burned up, but rather now, he says, we present ourselves as a living and holy sacrifice sacrifice so we don't come in death (coughs) excuse me I've been doing this for a month you've got coffee I've got water okay (coughs) somebody told me a month ago you should go get a Kenalog shot I wish I would have done that (coughs) should have listened (coughs) But we present ourselves as living and holy sacrifices. And we don't just present a little of ourselves. The scripture says present your bodies, present your whole self to him. And we say, uh, you remember the story of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah sees the Lord lofty and exalted sitting on the throne of the temple. The, the train of his robe filled the temple. There were, there were angelic creatures all around who were shouting holy, holy, holy. And you remember what Isaiah said? He said, Lord, here I am. See, I give myself to you. Here I am. And he made that presentation. And as we do that, the scripture says, this is your spiritual service of worship. So get that. Our worship is not just when we come here and sing a song. We'll say that sometimes. Well, now let's go back into worship. 
And what we mean is we're going to sing more songs. That's not, that's not all there is. Certainly, that can be part of worship. But that's not all it is. Sometimes we think worship is, <clears throat> worship is uh, we raise our hands. Can be part of it. Sometimes we think worship is when we get down on our knees. That can be part of it. Sometimes we think worship is when I get my billfold out and take some money and, and give it to the Lord. That can be part of it. But God just doesn't want your mouth or your billfold or your hands. It says present your bodies as a living sacrifice. God, I'm going to live for you every day. And what you want me to do, I'm going to try to do. I'm presenting myself. In the Old Testament, when they would come and they would bring that lamb and they would present it to you. Now today, Lord God, I'm coming and I'm presenting myself to you. And that's the beginning of living this Christian life. And I hope you've done that. Here's the problem. So many of us, we want to present a little of ourselves, but not the whole thing. Lord, you can have my mind, but my emotions, they're mine. Or Lord, you can have Sunday morning, but Friday night and Saturday night, that's mine. Or Lord, you can have this or that, but my money, that belongs to me. He says here, no, 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 no. Bring the whole package. As much as you understand of yourself, and you give it to as much as God as you understand, and you present yourself to him. I hope you're there. I hope you've done that. Maybe today you need to say, Lord God, I've been holding back on you, and here's what it is, but today I give this to you. So presentation, that's the first part. Moves on to the next verse, and he talks about confirmation, but it's a, a negative thing. He says, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to this world. The word conform means be squeezed into its mold. Be made to look like it. And what we're not supposed to look like is the world. Now that can be used in the New Testament three different ways. World can mean this thing that God has created, this planet. So it can mean that. It can also mean <clears throat> the world of men, of people. For example, John 3, 16, the Bible says, God so loved the what? World. He doesn't, now he, he made trees and he made dogs, okay? But that's not what he really cares about the most. He doesn't say, God so loved, you know, <clears throat> trees and dogs that I would send my son. No, he, it's the world of people. He loves people. And so that's another way the, you, or the word world is used. But what he's meaning here is the world that is hostile to God, that sets itself up against God. <coughs> For example, in 1 John where it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So he says there's, the, <clears throat> there's these two contradictory things. There is this world system that is against God, that does everything against God, and then there is the world <coughs> of God that God loves, and here it is. And so which one are you going to be conformed to? The scripture says, do not be conformed to this world. Rather, Romans 8, 29 says, be conformed to Christ. So you can't be conformed to both of those. You can't be conformed and look like this system that is against God, but at the same time, be conformed to God himself, the Son of God. You can't do both. And so he says here, do not be conformed to this world. Now, <clears throat> when we think about that, we ought to be careful the way we think about it. <clears throat> Because he's not talking about just external things. Some of those things make no difference whatsoever, the external things. Okay? For example, you, you've heard me say before, the, bi the big fashion right now is ripped jeans and white shoes. Okay? That's the big thing. There's nothing wrong with ripped jeans 
and white shoes that some of you have on this morning, okay? Nothing wrong with that, unless it's ripped and showing some places it shouldn't be showing, okay? That could be wrong. That could be kind of worldly. Nothing wrong with it. So some external things are not a big deal. What he's talking about is the spirit of the age, the mindset of the world, this age. That's what's wrong. Here, here are some things that are very much of the world. And it is the spirit of our age that we're dealing with right now. Materialism is one. Do not be conformed to materialism, but rather the opposite of that is being spiritual. See, materialism is all you think about is what I'm driving, this house that I have, more money in the bank, whatever, rings, jewelry, whatever. That's all materialistic things. And that's what the world goes after, but that's not what you and I are to go after. We're to chase more spiritual things. So that's what he's talking about when he says, don't be conformed to this world. Here's another thing big in this world, hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure. It used to be a saying, if it feels good, do it. It's, it's all about how can I have fun? How can I do things that feel good to me? That's hedonism. That is not Christianity. That's the world, but it but it rubs over into the church, and we want to, what makes me feel good? We wind up doing all kinds of things, sometimes very immoral things, if that becomes our pursuit. So the Bible says that's not, don't be conformed to that, but rather be conformed to Christ. Christ didn't just come and do everything that felt good. He never would have gone to the cross if he would have been a hedonist. That was not the way he was. So there's materialism, there's hedonism, there's, there's narcissism. You remember from Greek mythology, you remember Nasarsis? Nasarsis? <clears throat> Can't even say it. He, uh, this guy going along and he looks, all of a sudden he's going by this clear pool of water and he looks in and he sees his own reflection and he falls in love with himself. That's narcissism. And that's the way the world is. What's good for me? It's all about me. Who cares about other people? I'm looking at my reflection and I'm crazy about my reflection. See, that's all the world and that's what the Bible is telling us. Do not be conformed to this. It will squeeze you into this mold. You will look just like the world. That's going to be tragic, destructive for your life. Rather be different. Now, here's a question, folks. When we think about ourselves, okay, and this is all to be applied to all of us, have we made that presentation? Have we said, God, I'm yours, not just part of me, every bit of me, I'm yours, and then, and how different am I, God, from this world? How different am I? Not just external things. I mean, you know, you could say, everybody else is wearing white shoes, so I'm going to wear black shoes. That's not what he's talking about. If the rest of the world's materialistic, am I materialistic? If the rest of the world's hedonistic, am I the same way? If the rest of the world is in love with itself, am I, is that the way I am as well? And the scripture says we are to be different from that. And so as we're thinking this morning, we, we need to say, Lord God, show me, am I just like everybody else? People that don't even know you, am I just like them? Or is there something different about me? So presentation, make that presentation to him. Confirmation, do not be conformed to the world. And then the big thing that we want to talk about this morning, transformation. Now look at verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed. What does that mean? The Greek word that is translated here, transformed, is the word from which we get our English word metamorphosis. Now you may know that phrase, that term. It's like when a tadpole becomes a frog. I mean, it's the same beginning of a creature, but it's transformed there's metamorphosis and it becomes something else. Or when there's this caterpillar and it's crawling around on your plant 
And you look at it and you say, well, that's not very pretty. I mean, all these little prickly things sticking out everywhere and, you know, kind of inching along. And, and then that caterpillar finds a place and there's this cocoon. It becomes involved, uh, surrounded by this cocoon. And then it's in there for a while. And while it's in there, metamorphosis is taking place. And so what happens is, is that this caterpillar that's not all that attractive experiences metamorphosis and it comes bursting out of that cocoon and it's a butterfly now. A beautiful. That's the word here. Be transformed. And so what happens, folks, is this. That you come to Christ. Or let's don't use you. Let's use me. I come to Christ and I'm a mess. And I'm a caterpillar. <laughs> But over time, God works in me, and he transforms me, and, it, and I become something that's more attractive, and, and he transforms me, not to be a butterfly, but into the image of Christ. It's transformation. It's also the word that's used of Christ when he goes up on the mountain of transfiguration. Same word. He goes up on the mountain of transfiguration, and there the scripture says, remember the story, Peter, James, and John are with him, and it says his, his garments become dazzlingly white. It's like when it snows, and you go outside, and then the sun is shining, and it's beaming off that snow, and you can barely even hold your eyes open. It's so white. That's the way Jesus was. It says in Philippians 2 that he came and he veiled his glory when he came in his incarnation as a man. And he veiled his glory. And so we couldn't see it all the time. We'd just be blown away. But on the top of that mountain with Peter, James, and John, he, was, he experienced this metamorphosis. This glory comes shining out and he is transfigured. He is transformed and they're awed by what they see. That's what the verse is talking about. Do not be squeezed into the world system's image, but rather experience spiritual metamorphosis in your life. Now, how does that happen? Slowly, for one thing, but how does that happen? Two things, one in this passage, one that's not in the passage Two things, we, if we want to experience the spiritual metamorphosis, here's how, how we do it. We look at the Savior, and we look at the Scripture. And as we do those things, God transforms us. First of all, we look at the Savior. We look at Jesus. Hebrews says, fixing your eyes on Jesus. 1 John 3, 2 says this. Beloved, now we are children of God. We have come to him. He has adopted us into his family. We are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. So someday he's going to finish the job, but we haven't seen it yet. But it says, but we know that when he appears, when he comes and we see him, we will be like him. Why are we going to be like him? Because we will see him just as he is. There's something about seeing the resurrected, glorified Lord Jesus that is going to transform us. And so what we need to do even today is we need to fix our eyes on Jesus Put our, and take it off all this other stuff. Turn the TV off once in a while. Turn the, shut the computer down once in a while. And look at Jesus. And as we begin to see him, it begins to change us. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says this. But we all with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord. We, we cannot look full on it. It will blow us up. But we are looking at the glory of the Lord and we are being transformed into the same image. Being transformed into his image from glory to glory, a step at a time, doesn't happen all at once, just as from the Lord the Spirit. So what he's saying is, if you want to be transformed, if you want the spiritual metamorphosis to take place in your life, here's what's got to happen. You've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. Put your eyes on Jesus as you look at him. He will begin to work in you and make you more and more like himself. Okay? So we look at the Savior. 
But we also look at the scripture. Because look at verse 2 again. It says, do not be conformed to this world system, but be transformed, experience metamorphosis. How? By the renewing of your mind. So what he's saying is God is going to work on your mind, and as he works on your mind, it will shape the rest of you. I don't mean to insult you this morning, because it's true for me too, but you you know what our minds were like before we came to Christ? The Bible says they were depraved. Not exactly a great compliment, right? Also says our minds were darkened. Our understanding was darkened. So without Christ working in our life, we have depraved minds and darkened in our understanding. We don't think correctly. What we need is for God to change our minds. There are drugs out there that if you take them, they will alter your mind in a bad way. But if we take this and think God's thoughts after him and fix our eyes on the scripture as well as the Savior, we see what he says in the word. He transforms our mind. He renews them. You may need some of that today. Probably all of us do. Because we may come in these doors back here and we are thinking wrong thoughts. We're not, we're not thinking like God. We're thinking like the world or we're thinking the way we think we ought to think instead of we're not thinking like God. For example, we come in and maybe we come in the back and we say, you know what, really, I'm the most important person in this room. And really, all these people need to get out of my way and let me sit where I want to sit. And the temperature is not exactly what I want it to be, and it should be all about me. See, we we can think like that. The whole universe spins around me. That's not godly thinking. The Bible says for us rather to think of others more highly than ourselves. It says... We're to humble ourselves and exalt others and take care of others. So what we've got to do is change that depraved thinking into more godly thinking. And one of the ways that happens is through the Holy Spirit taking the Holy Scriptures and putting it in our heads, transforming the way we think. Here's another way. Maybe you come in and you don't think, I'm the most important person in this room. Maybe you come in thinking, I am the most pitiful person in this room. And I am worthless. Well, that's not true. Because you know what the Bible says? The Bible says you are so important that Jesus died for you. Stop the wrong thinking. Let the Bible shape your thinking. This is why we're, Josh has been talking about it every week. We're encouraging you, read your Bible. If you've messed up, you got behind, jump back in. This afternoon, you could catch back up. You could be with us and the middle of Matthew now. Read it. It'll change your mind. Here's another thing. People walk in. They say, man, nobody loves me. Nobody invited me to sit with them. Nobody came to sit by me. Nobody loves me. My family doesn't love me. Let me tell you some truth. Jesus loves you. God loves you. That is biblical truth. If you will begin to let that saturate your mind, it'll transform your life. Here's another one. <clears throat> you're coming into this room and you're saying, boy, you know what? I'd like to have a ministry, but I can't do anything. I, I, I have no talents, no gifts. I'm, I, don't, I couldn't do anything. What's the Bible say? I, I've lived my whole ministry on this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whatever he wants me to do. Some of our college students were asking me the other day, how do you get up there every week in front of all those people and I say, I have no idea, except that God has called me to it, and I know he's called me to it, and what God has called me to do, I can do. I can do all things. Folks, that has penetrated my mind. That has is, that is shaped my thinking, and when it begins to shape your thinking, it renews your mind. It will begin to transform your life. And if we could get all of us to really get into the Scripture and read the Bible, memorize it, let it meditate on it. Let it sink in. Go to a Bible study class. Pay attention in church to the preaching. Put it in our lives. If we can do that, 
It's going to change all of us. And what we will begin to see is a whole lot of caterpillars <laughs> being changed into the image of Christ. So present yourself. Do not be squeezed into the world's mold. And be transformed as we look at the Savior and we look at the Scripture and they change the way we think. And we begin to look more like Christ. So what does a, a Christian look like? What is a Christian? Well, of course, it's someone who's received Jesus as their Savior. But what do they begin to look like and how do they begin to live? Well, they present themselves to God. It's not about me anymore. It's about you. I, I give myself to you. And they say, and... and I'm not going to be just like this world. And I'm going to be transformed. I'm going, whatever in me that needs to be changed, I'm asking God to change it. So I'll be a different person. And every person in this room, starting here, has got things in their life that need to be transformed. So we're out of time. Let me ask you two questions as we go. Number one, do you know for certain that you really are a Christian? You can't live like one, act like one, look like one if you're not one. Have you ever received the gift that God wants to give you of salvation through his son? Have you ever received that? You don't work for it. You just receive it as a gift. And then the second question would be this. Are you one, but then are you looking like one and are you living like one? Maybe you received Jesus really as your Savior when you were eight years old. You really did. But there hasn't been a lot of transformation in your life, and you haven't really changed a lot to look more like Jesus. But you could start today. Maybe you need to say, Lord, here I am. I'm not holding back everything about me. Here I am. And I'm not going to let this world squeeze me. I'm going to be different. And I'm going to let you work in my life so that there will be incredible metamorphosis in me and I will be different. Let's pray together, please. Father, what an awesome God you are. What an awesome plan you have. And Lord, help us to just see the plan and bow to it and humbly receive what you want to do in our lives. And thank you that you want to work in us, not just today and tomorrow, but for as long as it takes. You're working in our lives. You're, you're changing us. You're making us different. You're shaping us into the image of Christ. Lord, I thank you that after all these decades, you're still working in me. And I know you want to work in other people too. So we pray this morning we will respond. As you say in the very first of this verse, I urge you. Lord, as you're urging us this morning, help us to respond to you and see progress and that from one glory to the other, we can be changed into your likeness. Help us do that, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name.